Good evening, everyone. Welcome to another King's ELAP event. I cannot believe this is the third academic year that the ELAP is existing, so happy birthday. And uh, tonight we have a very special guest, and we actually invited Gillian long before she was even a provost candidate, so I think the ELAP is your lucky charm. Um, and you gave us several talks on various topics in the past few weeks, but tonight we're here on a King's soil in a room full of King's people, who came to learn about you so no Which pressure much much more scary <laughs> <laughs> so i'll be asking the first several questions and then i'll uh, i'll give the word to you guys and you can ask whatever you would want to ask so jillian you did your phd in anthropology here in cambridge at clare mm -hmm. college can you walk us through your journey to cambridge and how do you reflect back on your student years here well my journey to cambridge really came about because when I was at school, I came from a background where in my family, girls were not really expected to do anything. Um, I had a wonderful mother who was amazing, but I really think her highest aspirations for me were to become a shally girl. And, um, you know, she'd left school at 16 and she came from that, you know, very strong um, post-war culture in certain parts of the country where essentially girls were told very much not to indicate ambition or even show that they were clever. I was told repeatedly after my O-levels not to tell anyone about my O-levels because that might, quote, scare the boys off. Um, but I was quite, it's very hard to imagine now, but that was, you know, I mean, she's a wonderful person. But, um, but I was basically, I sort of bucked the mold and I was academic. And against the odds and to everyone's shock, I got into Cambridge um, and, you know, I said I want to do anthropology because I had this passionate desire to go and travel and see the world. So I went off in my gap year and I went off to Pakistan. Um, I worked in a um, hospital and I did volunteer work for a year. Um, and then something happened, which was quite unusual, in that I went with a friend to Pakistan and she actually died. And it was incredibly traumatic. And the only reason I mention it is because in those days, there was no mental health provision. And no one ever said to me, should you take a gap year? Should you think about whether you really want to go to Cambridge straight away? And there certainly was no mental health provision when I came to Cambridge. And so as a result, I remember almost nothing about my first year. And one of the things I'm so thrilled about is the fact that when I look around King's today, there is such an incredible framework of mental health provision. And that is amazing, amazing progress. So I'd like to salute everybody who is involved in that and say it is so important and it's something I'm very deeply committed to. Um, the other thing to say is that when I arrived at Cambridge, I was very, very shy um, and very lacking in confidence and very convinced because of my upbringing that girls were not supposed to put their hands up, ever hustle, if they did, they would look bossy and pushy and a bit full of themselves. And I was so shy and so lacking in confidence that I vaguely thought I'd like to be a journalist and went along to the student's newspaper at Freshers Week and took one look at all these very confident people and ran away and never went back and never got involved in the student paper at all. Instead, I spent my three years basically backstage in the theatre being a set designer. And again, I only mention that because it's so easy, particularly for women, to assume that if you see somebody who's labeled as successful, that they must have known from the year dot what they wanted to do and must have somehow come out of the womb with the confidence to speak on stages and to basically create a career where the trajectory was like that. And I think it's beholden on anybody who is successful to be honest and say, actually, it's not like that. If you want to be successful and make a mark, you basically have to screw up over and over again and just fake it until it feels natural. And that's basically what I did. So the first time I had to give a speech, I was physically sick backstage. Um, I made myself go through with it and I've done it over and over again. And probably the first hundred were pretty bad, but by the 200th, it was less bad. <laughs> um. I really like that you pivoted various times throughout your career. You trained in an academic discipline. You then did um, 
your research in Tajikistan, which at the time was still part of the USSR. And then you pivoted as an FTA reporter into finance. And in your book, you wrote that investment banking conference is just like a Tajik wedding. So my question is, what transferable skills and tools did anthropology provide you with that allowed you to thrive in a different industry? Um, well, I'd like to explain briefly how I ended up in Tajikistan, because I owe a huge amount to Caroline Humphrey, um, who is well known to everyone here as a wonderful professor. And what happened after my BA was I realized I loved anthropology and I wanted to keep traveling the world. And by then I'd been in Pakistan for a year and learned some Urdu. And I'd also spent a lot of time in Tibet. And I wanted to actually to go to Western China, but Tiananmen Square happened. And so really through a series of accidents, um, it was actually Carrie who suggested I look at the Soviet Union and Tajikistan. And Tajik is quite close to Urdu. And so the theory was I could learn one and move to the other. Um, and then I was given Ernest Gellner as my professor. And again, one of my you know, great learning moments was that um, he, you know, the first few times I met him, he was terrifying too. And we hardly had a conversation. And it took me really two years before I actually managed to have a proper exchange of views. And then I realized what a total waste it had been to basically not talk to him because he was amazing. But I went off, I did my, I went off and did my field work. And I went to the Soviet Union when it was still the Soviet Union. Um, in those days, to get into the Soviet Union, um, it was very hard still. But it was a time of Perestroika and Glasnost, and they had just opened up at that moment for the first time ever, a British Council Exchange Program, which I basically took and was enrolled actually in a Soviet um, PhD program within the Soviet Academy of Sciences and Soviet system um, initially. So I had to do all these essays, you know, in Russian about communist anthropology and things like that. And I learned my Russian and Tajik saying things like, we must fulfill the five-year plan. And here's to international freedom, socialism, understanding, and electricity. Could not. <laughs> um, but so I went off there and I was basically doing classic anthropology where I was based up in the mountains um, and in a wonderful community of people. And then the Soviet Union began to break up. And by an extraordinary coincidence, and it's one of those, you know, amazing coincidences you couldn't plan. I'd actually asked at the end of my anthropology field work to go and work on the FT for a couple of um, weeks as an intern, um, essentially making the coffee. And I spent the first week as an intern making a coffee. By the way, I should say that because of my story and more broadly, I'm a huge fan of internships. And one of the things I want to try and do is get as many internships going as possible and to tap into the alumni network and really make that happen. Um, but I was extraordinarily lucky because in the second week of making coffee, um, the Soviet Union broke up. And I happened to be the only person in the entire FD building it was August, so everyone senior was on holiday. The only person in the entire FD building who spoke Russian and knew about <laughs> the Soviet Union. So I, by that stage, had learned a little bit to hustle. So I put my hand up and said, um, please, can I you know, have a role calling up my friends in Russian? So that was my first proper byline that day. And the next day, um, they wanted a piece on the Soviet ethnic minorities. So I said, I'll do that. And on the third day, true story, the foreign, ed foreign editor came out and said, um, we need someone to go to Vilnius tomorrow, Lithuania, because we think there's going to be a revolution. Does anyone want to go? And all the senior people were kind of looked down because they all had their, sum <laughs> they all had their summer holidays planned. It was August. So I stuck my hand up and said, I'll go. And no one knew who I was. And they said, OK, fine. And so he gave me $1,000 and told me to find a way to get to Vilnius. And it, it was, you know, by the way, the message from that is if anyone, you know, there's nothing wrong with ever sticking your hand up and just saying yes, and then working out how to do it afterwards. I'm a great <laughs> believer in jumping first and then finding how to, how to do something. And in those days, it, the only way you get to, to Vilnius was to fly to West Berlin and then take a taxi across Berlin because the airports weren't linked. Very hard for anyone under the age of 40 to remember this or believe this. And then I went to East Berlin and flew into Vilnius. And I didn't have a visa or anything. And 
I landed at the airport and the border guard said, where's your visa? And I said, you've just declared independence. Give me a Lithuanian visa. And they said, oh, good point. <laughs> <laughs> so they literally wrote down on a bit of paper, um, you know, we give, you know, this strange creature. And by the way, everyone else was running away from Lithuania. You know, I was pretty much the only person going in because that's what journalists do. Um, and they wrote me a Lithuanian visa and stupidly, I threw it away. If I'd kept it, I could frame it. But I landed and there was indeed a revolution going on. Um, and I spent the next, you know, six, seven months just traveling. And I became the kind of FP's cannon fodder in that if there was a really unpleasant place that no one else wanted to go to, um, I got sent there. Um, again, another rule of starting any career is apart from putting your hand up, always work holidays, weekends, if you can, when the senior people are away and you can jump in and do something important instead. Um, the other person who was also buzzing around by chance at the time, and we became good friends, um, was someone called Christia Freeland, who will probably be the next prime minister of Canada. And she happened to be Ukrainian. So we split up the Soviet Union between us. And we agreed that when there was wars and nasty things near Ukraine, she did that. And when there was horrible stuff happening elsewhere, I did that. And that's really how I became a journalist. And then at the end of that, sorry, I've spoken too long. Um, at the end of that year, um, I came back, I finished off my PhD. Um, I did it partly because a friend bet me I wouldn't. And so I thought, damn it, I'll show them. Um, and, but also because I really wanted to, I thought I owed a great debt of gratitude to the village in Tajikistan who had hosted me. And in Tajikistan, there was a very brutal war, horrific civil war, which um, people I know got caught up in. Um, things were so bad in Tajikistan for a while that it had the ghastly distinction of being the only country that people fled from into Afghanistan. Everyone else was trying to get out of Afghanistan. Um, but I thought I owed it a debt, you know, a debt to the villagers to finish it off and as a tribute to what had been. It was now then history. Um, and then I joined the FT as a trainee journalist. And they said to me, you're going to have to learn about economics and finance if you want to work here. And I thought, God, how boring. And they put me on the money market desk. And I thought, this is terrible. I'll sit here for six months until I go and do something really important, like go and write about another small war. And then about three months later, I suddenly woke up and realized, that actually, I was incredibly wrong and very arrogant. And actually, my aversion to economics was driven by fear, not by anything else, because it was a language I didn't understand. And I realized that if you don't understand how money goes around the world, you don't really understand power. But I also realized that if you only look at money through the lens that economists have traditionally used, you don't really understand anything either, because you have to understand the cultural context of money. So I decided to try and sort of devote my career to combining these two perspectives. Which links to my next question, because you pretty much saw the financial crisis coming and wrote about it it as early as 2005, when no one was talking about credit derivatives, et cetera. And then in an interview, you said that you questioned yourself, um, am I crazy? Is the system crazy? I'm not crazy, the system is crazy. And it turns out you were right. My question is, how did this experience shape you to be the journalist you are now? Um, well, the reason I first began to think that something was wrong with the financial system was actually not so much to do with the nature of finance, but the way that journalists were writing about it. And it started earlier because um, in 2003 and four, I was running something called the Lex column of the Financial Times, which is the back page of the FT that does corporate analysis. And the editor asked me to create a memo talking about what we should focus on. And I started off writing the usual memo and then I suddenly thought, well, what happens if I stop for a moment and look at this as if I was an anthropologist again? And I was back in a you know, village and analyzing it in the same way that I'd used my analysis in Tajikistan. And the amazing power of cultural anthropology, which I'm evangelical about, is that it's not so much about being, you know, doing Indiana Jones for adults and going and staring at you know, weird and wacky places. It's actually about a three-part journey which anybody can use. And the first step of the journey is that you deliberately try and immerse yourself 
in the lives and minds of people who are different from you. And you get out of your comfort zone to understand how other people think and empathize with them. But you do that not just to understand how other people think and gain humility about the fact that actually not everyone thinks the way that you do, shock, um, which is a lesson, by the way, that most of Wall Street and you know, Silicon Valley could learn, but also because the single best way to understand yourself is to jump out of your skin and go and look at yourself as others might. So the Chinese have this phrase, you know, a fish can't see water. You know, you have to go swim with other fish to look back and see yourself. And you do that to look at, to then try and gain perspective on what um, anthropologists call social silences, that from Pierre Bourdieu. Um, and when I used that kind of perspective on the city of London in 2004, what I could see was that the media was focusing almost obsessively and exclusively on a tiny part of the financial world, which was the equity market, stock market. And they were ignoring almost everything else because they labeled it as boring and geeky and dull. And that was things like credit markets and derivatives. So I became really interested in the kind of social silence around what was really shaping modern finance and wrote a series of memos, which I called the iceberg memos to my editors, um, which were somewhat ill-judged actually in some ways, um, saying that you know we were reporting this completely wrong. And so they responded to me by saying, okay, well, if that's what you think, um, go and write about it yourself, um, which I did and turned up and sort of became obsessed about trying to look at this whole world of finance, almost subterranean world of finance, um, as if I was an anthropologist trying to look not just at what people were saying, but what they weren't saying. And I used the kind of same skills I'd used to deconstruct tajik wedding rituals um, to look at investment banking conferences, because they're very similar in many ways. You know, an investment banking conference pulls together a scattered tribe and uses formal and informal rituals to recreate social ties and to recreate a shared worldview. And it's very hard for insiders to see the contradictions in that shared worldview or to see what they're missing because they're insiders and they can't see those social silences. So when I applied that perspective to finance in 2005, I could kind of see what they were um, you know, de deluding themselves. They had this kind of great creation mythology, which like all professional tribes, everyone has a creation mythology, including journalists and academics. And there's always contradictions in it. Um, and in this case, the contradictions were very clearly pointing to the system spinning totally out of control. When I started raising those points, um, I got a lot of pushback, unsurprisingly. You know, turkeys don't vote for Christmas. Elites never like to be told that they are, you know, basically screwing up or that the system is unsustainable. Um, but I sort of stuck to my guns initially in 2005. Um, and then I went off on maternity leave and I thought the system would blow up in late 2005. And when I came back, it hadn't blown up. So I had a few months thinking, gosh, I was completely wrong. And then I flipped again and thought, actually, no, you know, it's really unsustainable. Um, and then it did blow up in 2007. But I guess the main thing it taught me is that actually looking at social silences and asking what people aren't asking is a really powerful tool. And the other thing it showed me is that if powerful people and elites are yelling at you, it probably means you're doing something right. <laughs> um, on that note, I'm wondering, what are we not talking about today and we should be? Um, there are a lot of things. I mean, I'm very concerned about debt levels. Um, I think it's amazing that people haven't talked enough about the unsustainability of global debt levels all over the place. Um, very concerned about things like antimicrobial um, resistance and the threats of that, that pose. Um, concerned about unsustainability of pensions. Um, you know, I could go on and on, but those are some of the things. Methane is a kind of an obsession of mine. Hmm. The fact that, sorry, I sound very, but you know, people talk a lot about decarbonization. Um, you know, they don't talk nearly enough about methane and what's happening on that front. My next question is hopefully a bit more positive. It's about entrepreneurship. Um, you experience the entrepreneurial culture here in Britain as well as in the United States, as well as all around the world. So my question for the students in the audience is, 
what would be your advice on what makes a good entrepreneur and what do you think we can learn specifically from the US environment and what we perhaps should not be following? Um, well, first of all, I would actually flip it around and say that the issue at stake is not about entrepreneurship or being an entrepreneur. And, you know, the e-lab actually, you know, yes, it's about being you know, entrepreneurs. It's really about an entrepreneurial mindset. And I can't stress that strongly enough because the point about an entrepreneurial mindset is that you're willing to challenge the status quo. And you're not going to just sit there and, and accept the way that things are, are done because they've been done that way forever. And you're willing to try and reimagine the world and to take risks and to essentially, if something doesn't work, try again and not be scared of basically yeah. failure. And if something goes wrong, you just pick yourself up and try again and again and again. And obviously, there are lots of contexts where that doesn't work. Um, and there are lots of cases where you can't just, you know, move fast and break things, you know, to quote Mark Zuckerberg. But having that entrepreneurial mindset and that ability to actually say, you know what, just because the world looks like this today, you can still try and reimagine it for the future, I think is incredibly valuable in every possible sense, whether you're working in tech or medicine or academia or, you know, whether you're trying to build a company. But building a company is just one part of a wider entrepreneurial mindset. And it's something which I think has sometimes not been as present in the UK as it could and should be. Um, there are many, many, many things I don't like about America. Um, you know, big hair, big portions, Donald Trump, huge inequality, all of that. Um, but one of the things I do love about America is this willingness to take risks um, and this belief that failure is not terminal. It's an education. And the idea that you can reinvent yourself at any age, yeah. um, you know, I'd almost forgotten that it's normal to retire at 65 because, you know, that isn't seen quite the same way in America. Um, and also this ability to get out and hustle. And in particular, um, for women in New York, it's very, very liberating um, because there is a really strong sense network of support. Um, and there's also a really strong sense of, you know, the sky's a limit. You don't have to apologize for trying to be successful or having ambition. And if there's one thing I wish I could inject into British culture today, it's to take away the sense that we have to apologize for being ambitious. Um, I really feel that very strongly indeed. Um, and just one tiny vignette, I sometimes tell, that to illustrate what I mean, you know, I went to New York in my mid 40s and I'd recently separated from the father of my children. And um, in London, when I told people, you know, that it was quite a tough time, um, the response would be, oh, I'm so sorry. God, you poor thing. Oh, I'm so sorry. God, that's so hard. And there'd be a long pause. And in New York, when I told people that, they'd go, oh, God, I'm sorry. But hey, I know a great guy. I can set you up with some <laughs> <laughs> You know, and everyone's trying to broker a deal. And I'm not saying that, you know, it's a, it's a silly example. But that spirit of reinvention at any age and that spirit of saying, I'm not going to give up with gritted teeth and I'm going to try and try and try again. And that belief that it's possible to reach for the stars is something, you know, I feel so strongly. Which beautifully linked. And I'm sorry if that's all hippy diddy in American. <laughs> Someone told me I sounded all gooey in American the other day. It's probably true. But you know, <laughs> apologies for that. This links beautifully to my last question before we open up the floor to audience. Prior to this interview, you shared a very powerful memo with me that you wrote to one of your female colleagues in which you say, if you don't have a helpful mom or an amazing partner, then don't despair. Not everyone does, and I didn't, but I survived, and you can too. You touched upon it now, but with all of this that's been said so far, how would you describe your leadership style today? Ooh, well, that came from a memo that I actually wrote to um, women in the FT about how to do the dreaded juggle. And, you know, if you've got small kids and you're trying to get a career going, it's tough, you know. And for some people, it's even tougher because, you know, in my case, my mother died and, you know, I was basically single effectively for a number of years. And it was really, really tough. I had a number of really tough years. And guess what? That happens. And something that my daughters and I, uh, my kids and I often joke about is what I call the, you know, toilet cleaning syndrome is that every time we ever felt remotely tempted to pity ourselves, 
And there were times it was, you know, it was tough. I'm not going to gloss over it. Um, I'd always say, you know what, just because I'm working two jobs as a single mom to make ends meet, you know, my my second job is basically writing books, giving speeches or whatever. That is so easy because the reality is that the vast majority of single mums who are struggling to raise their kids are doing so by cleaning toilets in their spare time. And that is the reality. And we should never forget that actually out there, there's a whole world of people who are struggling much, much harder and have none of the privileges we have. Um, so one of the reasons I wrote the memo was actually to say to the FD women, you know, okay, so it might feel tough, but just keep going. And so it's a long memo, happy to show anyone. It got circulated quite widely. Um, in terms of, and now I should say, by the way, that I'm very, very lucky indeed. You know, I'm extraordinarily lucky. You know, I've got two amazing kids who you probably see floating around campus. I have an amazing partner um, who is up there, um, who's amazingly supportive. He'll probably kill me later for saying that, but he is. <laughs> um, and so I'm really, really lucky in that respect. Um, it's funny, we were actually, um, the two of us were in Kiev about three or four weeks ago and gave um each of us gave speeches do you mind if i tell the story okay <laughs> so each of us gave speeches to um here business school and then to a large collection of young global leaders um really just to try and you know express our support and i've been going to Kiev for many years um it's a place i care very deeply about and you know i've been giving these speeches to the young global leaders for a long time but you know this year it felt really important to say keep going so Henrik went first, and he's a venture capitalist. And so they he was supposed to talk about venture capital. And they asked him about risk and how he tolerates risk. And he said something along the lines of, well, it's my first experience of being in a war zone, and I'm really scared. Um, but my girlfriend's done lots of this, and she isn't. I didn't know that. And so I then turn up, and I give my speech about the media. And um, at the end of that, you know, they ask for questions. And the first question comes up, and I'm all braced to talk about economics in the media. And the first question comes up and says, your boyfriend just came and said <laughs> <laughs> that you have very different attitudes for the risk. So what we'd really like to know is how do you keep a relationship going? <laughs> <laughs> and how do you combine it with a career? Um, and what I said, which was true, is again, as part of this entrepreneurial mindset, you know, we, you screw up early in your life. If you doesn't work out, you know, you can always try again. And we're very lucky. And, you know, I'm in a very different situation today. But in terms of my leadership style, I don't know. I guess I'm probably a player manager. I believe very strongly that you have to experience um, what's happening to the people if you're trying to lead them. Um, you have to try and project clarity and communicate with people, um, but to do so with a touch of empathy. It's never easy. Um, I was running um, a large team of journalists in the FT um, in America. For a number of years um running journalists is truly like herding cats because they're always convinced that they're smarter than you and um, they never want anyone to tell you what what you know what to do um and i used to joke that i couldn't imagine a harder management challenge than running a large team of journalists and here i am <laughs> <laughs> i see all the fellows smiling so <laughs> <laughs> yeah if anyone wants to give me any tips i'm very very open to all the advice and tips I can get um, <laughs> thank you with that said let's take the questions from the audience anyone guys please you go ahead uh, I was, I was, hello I love that you touched on the entrepreneurial mindset uh, there's a lot of young people who believe they have this entrepreneurial mindset and are very risk tolerant, but they just can't make that break or yeah. they don't have the idea or just something is not clicking for them. What would your advice be for those kind of people? Um, well, in the first instance, I would suggest they should go and talk to actually Henrik, who actually has been an entrepreneur in practice and has built companies and invested in them. And so, frankly, I haven't done that. The nearest I've come to that has been creating, I created the Financial Times is a sustainability platform, which is a bit like being an entrepreneur, but hasn't actually been one. Um, so to go and ask Henrik first and foremost, um, listen, it's tough being an entrepreneur. You either need to have a lot of energy, a lot of risk tolerance, a lot of self-belief, or a lot of family money. Um, ideally, you have all four, but you know, most people don't. And so it is tough. 
There are grants out there these days to help young entrepreneurs, which is fantastic. There are networks, um, but I'm not for a millisecond minimizing the challenge. That's reality. But the thing I would say is that one of the amazing joys of coming back to Cambridge, which I truly love, um, apart from seeing this extraordinary mental health provision, which is just fantastic, and I salute everyone who's worked to create that, um, is the fact that when I was at Cambridge 35 years ago, entrepreneur was kind of a dirty word. It was kind of what you did if you couldn't become a lawyer or accountant, and if you weren't hippie enough to become an anthropologist. Um, you know, the fact that a place like King's is throbbing with, take away the word entrepreneur, take away the word business, okay? Just focus on the entrepreneurial mindset. The fact that a place like King's is throbbing with this entrepreneurial mindset is just amazing. I cannot stress how fantastic the mindset is. And, you know, it's, it, one of the reasons I wanted to come and do this job is because I truly believe passionately that if we're going to reboot Britain, if we're going to create growth, if we're going to sh throw off these shackles of negativity, and if we're going to stop just sitting in the corner whinging and grumbling, as opposed to finding solutions, we've got to embrace this entrepreneurial mindset in the broadest possible way. And it's not just about building businesses at all. It's about doing brilliant research in the most creative way possible. Turing was an entrepreneur, had an entrepreneurial mindset. You know, um, Darwin had an entrepreneurial mindset. I mean, we've got to get ready and just go out and create things again and believe we can do it and believe we can do it as a nation. I believe that very strongly and respect people who do. Um, doesn't really answer your question, but you know, um, I just salute anyone who's willing to go out and give it a go. Go ahead. And I mean that, you know, I really strongly in terms of science, humanities, all of that. Um, thank you so much for the for the talk. I just wanted to, regarding journalism and, and your opinion as a journalist, what you might think of people losing faith in media and journalism mm -hmm. and the kind of breakdown of trust and how you see we move forward from that. Yeah, it's, it, the breakdown of trust is really profound. Um, there's a survey that comes out each year by the Edelman Public Relations Group, which is really worth looking at if you are interested in this. And what it shows is that in 2007, there was, surprise, surprise, a complete collapse of trust in banks. And that was followed by a trust, collapse of trust in big business. And then there was a collapse of trust in government. And so journalists like myself spent all our times writing about, you know, just look at this, you know, no one trusts the bankers anymore. And now we're in a situation where trust in the media is about the same level, if not lower, than trust in bankers. So you can call that divine re retribution, um, or you can say that actually it's a sign of a much bigger societal problem. And the reality is that, you know, the good side of digital communications is the rise of citizen journalism, and that's fantastic. And the relationship between the journalists and the public has changed dramatically from being you know, a vertical relationship where journalists came down like Moses coming down from the mountain with a tablet and just handing it over to a horizontal relationship where essentially the minute I write anything on the FT website, I get instant feedback and it's a kind of almost a two-way communication process. Um, but that's gone hand in hand with, as you say, a collapse of trust. And some of that's because of your shifting the trust pattern from vertical to lateral, horizontal. A lot of it's because of the explosion of misinformation. And a lot of that is, you know, deliberate or, you know, it's basically stoked up by different groups. And on top of that, you've had this really um, pernicious pattern where dash into cyberspace has fostered tribalism to a large degree. And essentially, you have different tribes, different groups, social groups um, online, who really only trust each other, not authority figures, but don't overlap with each other and deride other people's perception of the truth in a very tribal way. So you put all that together, and it's a really toxic mix. And you know, I'm terrified of what's going to happen in the future 
with things like AI and deep fakes and things like that is a huge threat to democracy. Um, the good news is that there's growing awareness of it. And the good news is there are people in the tech landscape who've made their gazillion dollars who are now throwing money um, into the um, question of how you fix that. And a lot of people are thinking about that. Um, the other bit of good news is that I do think that, you know, what's happening creates a space for people who are trying to provide credible media, um, like the Financial Times and others, to actually build audiences, and that's good. Um, but it's a challenge. There are no two ways about it. Um, I um, really apologize in advance for um, strongly disagreeing with um, something you said earlier, but mm -hmm. I wanted to quote the great American philosopher Kinky Friedman, who said, the higher the hair, the closer to God. So big hair is, you know. Usually <laughs> 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 when people write to me at the FT in response to a column, they're not nearly as polite. <laughs> they just, you know, they just say, you're wrong. <laughs> Just kinky Friedman just had yeah. very strong feelings on the topic, and I would have. I say big hair because I did. I you know I used to joke whenever I went on Fox TV. I've uh, done quite a bit of Fox. They always gave me hair like that. You mm -hmm. know, and I always had to wear an outfit like a parrot and look bright <laughs> or something. But um, that's right. Oh well, you didn't miss much. But um, the question that I had is, um, I, I read uh, the speech that you gave in, in I think accepting um, your position at King's College, which was extraordinarily inspiring and hit so many interesting notes and and thoughtful notes. One of which was around the idea of British um, intellectual capital and British academia. And you know, I <clears throat> wonder in today's world where we're all becoming a mix of something. What does it mean? What does British academia and what does British entrepreneurship mean? And how does it differ from academia elsewhere and entrepreneurship elsewhere, if at all, if it does? OK, well, I was using Britain simply as a geographical signpost, not to mean any designation of culture. And when I say, you know, rebooting Britain as a British person, you know, I desperately want to see Britain flourish and fly to the moon. Um, but I also recognize that there's a whole swathe of people in Cambridge who are not British. And I just hope that the experience of being here allows them to fly to the moon too. And I hope that Britain becomes a place where people think they can come and fly to the moon on the back of that. Um, that's really what I meant by that. Mm. In terms of how British academia differs from elsewhere, um, I'm in learning mode and listening mode, and I have a lot to learn not least of which is how not to give speeches sounding like a gooey American. Um, I really do have a lot to learn. So I'd say, ask me in a year's time. I'm, you know, I spent the best part of the last dozen years um, in America. I am pretty familiar with how the American academic system works. Um, I remember how the Cambridge used to work 35 years ago. Um, but as I say, things are changing quite fast. And, you know, I'm very excited about having the chance to, to learn. Um, and by the way, for all of you who are at King's, you know, if I make mistakes along the way as I'm learning, you know, let me know. And the, another great thing about being America is we can take criticism on the chin. You don't have to be passive aggressive. Just tell me up front. <laughs> um, over there, please. <laughs> and by the way, I didn't actually realize I'd given a formal speech. I didn't actually re realize it was written down anywhere, but. Um, welcome to alumni. Oh, welcome to alumni. Oh, right, that. Okay, great. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I'm going to do a brief introduction of myself. I noticed the others didn't do that. So, my name is Linda Babalola. Um, I'm in the Cambridge Church Business School in the EMBA program. I'm from Nigeria, but I live in the United States and I'm a public health physician. Um, so your story is very interesting, and I see um, some things in my past before I became a doctor similar to yours, coming from um, Nigeria, and how women struggle to um, grow and just get a good education, because you're like, oh, if you study too much, your boys are going to get scared of, you're not going to get married and all of that. Mm -hmm. um, so a couple of things. I, I wanted to find out if in the course of growing in your career, you've had to deal with um, imposter syndrome. Yeah. And um, the other thing is that um, 
um, I know that there were times where you like struggled and everything. What was the thing that kept you going? Was it your faith? Was it your self-belief? Did you like um, depend on external sources to just keep being motivated? And the last question is, um, how have you used your platform over the years to support other women um, to become entrepreneurs? Because um, there's still a lot of gap for women um, being entrepreneurs. And, and now that you're in this unique position, um, what plans do you have to support women, um, not just um, in the Western world, but globally and people from um, low-income countries to sort of succeed and leverage all of these opportunities that are coming up in technology, um, AI, and all of that. Um, I'm sorry, I know my questions are a lot. Thank no, you. It's fine, it's fine. Yeah. Um, well, first of all, congratulations for what you've done. That's amazing. And, you know, I know there are so many incredible stories in Cambridge of people who've managed to wiggle their way and keep going, you know, often from circumstances that didn't necessarily leave them easy there, but wiggle their way and keep going to amazing places. So well done. Um, what kept me going? Um, like any, you know, woman doing the juggle and also men as well, you know, I mean, you know, it's very tough for a lot of men as well doing the juggle. I'm not going to, you know, gloss over that. What kept me going often was simply having to pay the mortgage, damn it. Um, <laughs> but, um, you know, I had to get out there. Um, you know, it was trying to, like everyone, create a decent place for my kids, for, you know, my kids, all that kind of stuff, you know, and sheer bloody mindedness that I wasn't going to be defeated. Um, and just, you know, yeah, that much than anything else. Um, in terms of, you know, what have I done to support other women? Um, probably not nearly enough. You know, I'm super conscious that, you know, to those to whom much is given, much will be required. And I've had a lot of people help me in the past, and I've been very blessed in lots of ways. And again, to sound hippie dippy in American, I really want to try and give back and pay it forward. It's something that's much easier to say in America than in Britain, frankly. It's not as commonly said in Britain, but it's something which, you know, one of the good sides about America is it's a very deeply ingrained sentiment. Um, and if you've had a sense of a bit of success, it is incumbent on you to pay it forward by either doing public service or volunteering or, you know, in other ways. And I believe that very strongly. Um, in terms of, you know, helping women, I mean, I will do whatever I can just to kind of, you know, talk to people, um, help them, point them in places. And I hope that at some point in the future, I can do more to help women outside the UK. Um, you know, obviously Tajikistan is dear to my heart, um, but that's the work in progress. Yeah. And I think the imposter syndrome. <laughs> oh, the whole time. I mean, again, actually, that's one thing I feel very strongly is that I, you know, I still feel a bit of imposter syndrome sometimes. Every single successful woman I know who does as well, you know, from be that, you know, Hillary Clinton, Sarah Sandberg, um, you know, you name it. I don't know a woman who doesn't feel some element of imposter syndrome. I suspect men probably do too, but they probably don't talk about it. Um, you know, I always say to people, just fake it, fake it, fake it, fake it until you start to believe it yourself. Or if you can convince other people, you might begin, believe to begin, it, begin to believe it yourself. Thank you. Over there at the back, please. I'm going to throw it. <laughs> All right, that's a good catch. Um, so my question is about we, we spoke a lot about the entrepreneurial mindset and also putting yourself out there and all of these type of very um um should i say pop, uh, popular uh, beliefs uh, in entrepreneurship like championing encouraging beliefs do you see any risk about adopting this type of mindset when it comes to pursuing entrepreneurial activities because obviously um this in, in when we speak about being um a socially conscious entrepreneur or anything like that this is a very contextualized idea because in this room for example or within like the cambridge ecosystem um i'm sure that most of the entrepreneurs when we um sh sh should i stand up just so you can see your face yeah. <laughs> it's, um Obviously, we we were exposed to a lot of education uh, in regarding to, like social responsibility or um, understanding the entrepreneurial environment that we situate ourselves in, whether economically, philosophically, sociologically, or whatever. But do you see any risk of just purely adopting this mindset um, throughout all different um, types of, uh, let's say, educational backgrounds or social context? Um, okay, and I think two, and then yeah, sure, yeah, absolutely. One online, yeah. 
Okay, uh, so there is one question online by Richard Eggy, who is a big fan of you. I mean, there's a lot of text about how he loves your column, all your work. So I'm not gonna, yeah, yeah. I'm gonna skip through through that. It's a bit of a love letter. We may get him a free lunch, whoever he is. <laughs> Uh, he's saying, as you take this new challenge, I understand being the provost of kings, what is your biggest hope and your biggest fear? Okay. I won't throw this one. Actually, I will. Let's try. Are you okay? <laughs> I think on behalf of the room, thank you so much for those uh, incredibly inspiring uh, life stories that you've shared with us. Um, if through your career, if you've made use of coaches or mentors, um, what would your recommendations be to us who are potentially starting out in our careers on how to make uh, best use of those relationships? Okay, let me take that one last, that, that one first, because that's the easiest one. Um, to be honest, I'm often asked in America if I had a mentor. And the honest answer is that when I joined the FT, um, I mean, I had people who helped me a lot, like, you know, Harry Humphrey was very inspirational. Um, but when I joined the FT, there were no senior women at the FT at all. Um, you know, really, there weren't. It was, you know, they, they were beginning to take women, but there was, you know, very strong culture still then that, you know, one of my friends who's now risen to great things um you know got pregnant and was made very clear to her and this wasn't that long ago that you know someone actually said to her you know little babies need their mothers are you sure you want to keep working kind of thing um so I kind of didn't really have a mentor as such I had people who helped me along the way but I didn't really have a mentor I didn't really have a role model either um so one thing I think is truly fantastic apart from the fact that things have changed radically um in one generation and the FG now is 50-50 male female and the leadership team is very female we have a female editor um, we have a lot of women at the top levels um, and that shows to me that things can change um, you know the big task now is to fight for more racial equity frankly um, but you know never say never if you look at how far things have changed in one generation for women you know you have to believe that the world can be remade in ways that we can't necessarily imagine today um, but I do think mentors are fantastic. Um, and I think it's something which, again, you know, could and should be embraced. And it's another area where, you know, alumni can help, other people can help. It's absolutely something which I think an idea we could and should be borrowing more of, um, along with the idea of internships, personally. That's my own view. Others may disagree. Um, what were the other questions? So a difficult one of my hopes and fears. And the first one, I'm sorry, I've forgotten. Uh Yes, um, the first one was... Oh, yeah, what, what, what can't you be entrepreneurial? Where, where can't you impose the entrepreneurial mindset? Um, I'm very conscious, sitting in a 600-year-old university, that there are times and places where institutions and situations have enormous historical traditions that need to be celebrated and respected and venerated. Um, and that is a reality, and I totally recognise that and applaud that. So there are times when it doesn't pay to be entrepreneurial, definitely. Um, and there are times when, as I said, the idea of moving fast and break things is not appropriate. Um, you know, if you're going to move fast and break things in the world of consumer tech, good luck, go for it. If you're going to try and do that in banking and end up imperiling the savings of loads of people, that's not a good idea, necessarily. Um, you know, healthcare is another area where, you know, moving too fast and breaking things in a risky way can actually cause human damage. So you have to think about the context and recognize that it's a fine line. There are places and times when respect for tradition is a good thing. Um, in terms of greatest hopes and fears, um, well, my greatest hope, to put it crudely, is to simply try and contribute, um, it really is, and to try and help people here um, celebrate the extraordinarily pool of intellectual capital, which is Cambridge. I mean, it is just mind blowing. Um, I sometimes say that, you know, the college system, a place like King's College, is like a gigantic chemistry experiment um, where you take all these ambitious molecules from all around the world that come from different parts of the periodic table in terms of different backgrounds and disciplines and interests and, you know, political beliefs, and you put them all together into a test tube and you apply masses of pressure 
So they all hit each other. And out of those collisions um, come new compounds. And that is a brilliance of the college system. And one of the things that took my breath away, um, and I'd like to again be American and give a big shout out to Robin, the vice provost, who organized the most, and again, it's totally embarrassing because I'm sorry, Robin, I'm going to be hippy dippy in American. And I know that's not your style, but I just like to give him a massive shout out because mm. he organized the other day the most brilliant event, which was to get half the fellows to each give 90 seconds worth talks on their own particular field of interest. And it just blew my mind because most people don't realize what absolute incredible creative spirits we have around us and the sheer variety of stuff that people are doing. I mean, it's unbelievable. Um, and you know, one of my hopes is I can find a way to take this incredible pool of talent and celebrate it on the world stage and get it the recognition it deserves. And frankly, get it the recognition it deserves inside this country. Because I don't feel that people in Britain realize what they've got sitting on their doorstep and realize that frankly, the intellectual capital sitting in Cambridge is one of the great national riches that people, ordinary people, voters and politicians should be celebrating every single day. And the idea that the government sits there and starts talking about you know, cutting back funding or being disrespectful makes my blood boil. Um, I'm probably gonna get myself into trouble by saying this too strongly, but you know, so my greatest fear, frankly, is, and you know, and I say, I want, to, I want to celebrate this, I want to convene it, I want to give it the respect it's due and find ways to take it to the moon. Um, my greatest fear is that apart from, you know, the idea that somehow we'll get kicked out of Horizon again, um, or that, you know, there'll be more national you know, blows and shocks, um, or a fear that, you know, you know we'll, we'll go further into a situation where British people don't feel the kind of pride and passion they should do. Um, you know, those are probably my greatest, you know, fears um, that, you know, people won't realise what the incredible treasure is that we have here sitting in Cambridge and don't fully use it to its mass maximum ability. And above all, don't actually celebrate the people who have created this. And that's frankly, a lot of you. Amazing. With that said, we only have one minute and then we really need to wrap up. So we always finish with a rapid fire question. Uh, are you ready? Yes. Okay, favorite book? Okay, and it's very odd. Um, I Captured the Castle by Jodie Smith. Um, I'm sure none of you have ever read it. I read it as a teen. You have? Uh, okay, you know why I loved it? It's because I read it as a teenager and I suddenly thought, you know what? Girls can be different and they don't have to be trapped by their past. Um, your favorite podcast show? Okay, this is really boring. Um, the FT podcast, because I make <laughs> It's true, I listen to it whenever I can just because. I know that I need to catch up on what I've missed. Um, Wall Street or the city? Can I say I love both? You can. Okay. Cycling or walking? Cycling. I love cycling. Um, in New York, I pretty it's pretty much the only way I got around New York. Um, you know, except when it was snowing. Um, but I love cycling around New York. One of the other examples of how your world can change in ways you can't imagine is when I first got to New York. Cycling in New York was almost unimaginable, and now it's everywhere. Um, and I'm looking, I haven't yet got a bicycle. I'm about to go and get a bicycle, and I look forward to cycling in Cambridge. Um, cat or dog? Dog, because I have a golden retriever um, called Charlie, who's actually a she. Um, she's called Charlie because my two kids had been squabbling for years, and the first thing they ever agreed on was to call her Charlie. And although I thought it was mad, I kind of went, fine, you agreed on something, we'll do it. So, <laughs> um, what is your go-to drinks order? I'm definitely a spicy margarita, always. And if you are to come up with a formal theme, what would it be? Um, I'd probably say glamour and glitter, because sometimes I think it's really fun just to dress up and to go wild. And lastly, Claire or Kings? <laughs> I gotta say both. <laughs> All right, I think I would, I'll okay. say that it's funny because when I was at Clare, um, I was very, very lucky, and I spent two years living in Old Court, and I actually used to joke to people 
um, that I was literally living in the shadow of kings, um, both physically, because it blocked out the sun. Um, <laughs> but also, you know, if you are at Claire, you just felt like you, you know, you, this, we were this tiny jewel and kings was just vast and famous and important. And whenever anyone, you know, said, oh, I've seen a picture of, of Claire, they always meant they'd seen a picture of kings. <laughs> um, I used to sit there and think, oh, you know, what is it about kings? I never for a millisecond imagined that, you know, 35 years later, I would end up here. And I just mentioned that because as part of my belief in reinvention and trying to believe in the impossible, you know, it's worth thinking, okay, in 35 years time, where will you be? I think with that answer, we can keep you. Thank you so much, Olivia. Thank, Thank, Thank you, everyone. By the way, I chose the Elon Musk book because um, I've seen him a few times. Um, I have pretty mixed feelings about him, to put it mildly. My blood boils about what happened in Ukraine with Starlink, um, which is, you know, I know I happen to know a lot about um, and was terrible. But I recently had a chance to go down and meet Walter Isaacson, who wrote the book about Elon Musk. He's somebody who will almost certainly turn up here quite soon, and he's very keen to come and give a talk soon. Um, and his book is, you know, it's fascinating. Um, and, you know, I'm not for a millisecond saying that I think Elon Musk is a great role model, quite the contrary often, but his story is absolutely fascinating. And it's a very powerful um, symbol for our age in so many ways. So for that reason, I do think it's worth reading. Thank you.